Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Lindsay Lerner, and you're listening to The Cost of the Status Quo. More people than ever are questioning why they do what they do and forging their own path. And on this show, I sit down with these entrepreneurs, trailblazers, creatives, and overall awesome beings to discuss the ideas, the opportunities, and the overall tips and tricks they're using so that the rest of us can do the same. This is The Cost of the Status Quo. Today, we are here with Chris Shemra. If it has to do with gratitude, team building, or pasta, count Chris in. Chris has become a Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Gratitude Through Hard Times and Gratitude and Pasta. When he's not writing, coaching, and helping others, Chris has become a founding member of Rolling Stone Magazine's Culture Council and sits on the executive board at Fast Company Magazine. Chris's 747 gratitude experience that we'll dive into today has been used to spark over half a million relationships through in-person and virtual experiences that serve folks from Fortune 50 CEOs to Olympians, Super Bowl champs, and more. So how do you take your passion and turn it into something viral? Chris is here to tell us his process and share some tips and tricks that you could incorporate into your world. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. It would mean the world to me if you subscribed, rated, and reviewed this. It really does help. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Oh, Lindsay, I'm, I'm just so excited to spend this time with you. You know, there's, there's not many people in this world that can say that they've truly followed the, the path of their heart, the path of curiosity, and the path of really smashing the status quo as much as you have. So I'm excited to learn from you as well as meet some of your listeners today. Heck yeah, man. So give us some context. Where did you grow up and how do you think that's shaped your perspective? I grew up on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, which is an 11 mile by five mile mosquito infested plot of land on the South Carolina coast. I think it attracted a very interesting group of people on a seasonal basis. It was a tourist resort, permanent resident population of 45, 50,000 locals, tens of thousands of amazing visitors every summer to our island. I had a great childhood friend group, but I developed an amazing ability to meet new people and show them our island and ask them questions about where they were from and be curious about their stories. And I think that that uh, growing up on Hilton Head really gave me the tools needed to go out into the workplace, go out into the world and just be used to meeting good people on a frequent basis. Totally. And were there any expectations of what you thought you wanted to do or what others maybe wanted you to do? From a young age, I think the expectations were that I would act the way my parents acted. I would show up in the community the way my parents showed up in the community. And eventually I would probably you know, go off to college just long enough to then come back home to Hilton Head and take over the family company. And so I think that was always instilled at a very young age that I would go into the business of real estate or I would get involved in community philanthropic activities on a daily basis and just follow in the Schember family footsteps. And yeah, that was that was kind of the plan well, until I got kicked out of college, sent off to rehab, jail, engaged in multiple episodes of non-suicidal self-injury. And people kind of said, yeah, I, I don't know if the, the plan we had for him is actually going to work out the way we thought. You know, if you looked at five-year-old Chris, he had a lot of energy. He had a lot of ideas. He had a lot of creativity. He had a very small amount of focus. And he was bouncing off every wall humanly possible. And, and I think what happened was that scared a lot of people. My outbursts, my energy, what was I liable to do next? And so they put this really heavy medicine on me. They diagnosed me with ADHD. I was given these medicines that were supposed to curb that ADHD. What it did instead was robbed me of my childhood memories, suppressed all creative output, and made me want to do everything other than what people wanted for me. 
and I think that's the monster that uh, was was created in a, a little a little pressure chamber of medicine, and uh, that's where the suicide, depression, jail, rehab came from. And and so I think the you know the medicine did it totally. And so going through obviously some of those pretty traumatic, tumultuous times. Are those experiences part of what's really been able to inform your current work that you're doing? The brain works in a very simple way. It either works against us or for us. If our brain is working against us, it tends to sabotage us. It tends to make us operate through the lens of anxiety or fear or anger or shame or regret or guilt or embarrassment. If it's working for us, we get to access these pretty special superpowers of curiosity and connection and empathy and generosity and creativity and innovation and action and all these great things. The choice of which brain shows up on a daily basis is our choice, is our sole 100% control of saying, are we looking at the world through the lens of the good or the bad? So the 15 years spent on cow tranquilizing ADHD medicine that led to non-suicidal self-injury, depression, jail, rehab, I used to look at that from a lens of, fuck me, asshole them, I'm a nobody. I needed medicine at 8 a.m. every day just to say hello to people. A very negative outlook. And to answer your question, it's only recently that I have looked back and said, actually, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Because I know how it feels to have my own brain limited, repressed, taken away from me, artificially enhanced or de-enhanced, whatever the opposite of that is, because I know what it means to be screaming from the inside, to be screaming out in pain and nobody listening, to not feel safe, seen, or heard, in the context of a medical perspective, I can empathize with others in that exact same emotional state. And it just so happens that, thank God, I was put under those medications for 15 years of my life because now I get to lead with empathy and connection and the great fervor of making sure that anybody in my power today, regardless of what I'm doing, will never not feel safe, seen, or heard under my direction or impact. Since you were so young when being put on on those medications, is that something that you've been able to talk with friends, family about, I'm presumably your folks, about that and, and kind of dissect that and the impact that it's had? I know you're you're close with your family. Yes. And there's not a single ounce of me that blames them. They wanted to do what was best for me. And they listened to the advice of these really smart doctors. And where I once used to blame the doctors, and at one point blame my parents. Now I'm grateful to the doctors. Now I'm grateful for my parents. I think that my life is not perfect now. We all need to redefine for ourselves what the word happiness is or contentment is or whatever it is. But I can look back at those, those days, the 15 years spent on that medication, and try to understand the positive benefits that I've felt since the medication. Has it taught me greater empathy? Yes. Compassion? Yes. Self-confidence? Yes. Did it bring my family closer? Yes. Did it now give me a community that I can advocate with? Yes. And a lot of these positive benefits stemming from that negative autobiographical experience allows me to give gratitude to it. 
the great researcher Philip Watkins actually proved that theory in his groundbreaking research called the grateful processing. And he found that when you can assign positive benefits to a negative autobiographical experience and you can give gratitude to it, you can process it, you can make it part of your narrative and you can use it as a, you know, a positive connection tool with others. And I've been blessed to be able to do that. And and where along the way did gratitude enter the scene for you? For all your listeners that are listening and are, you know, they keep hearing this word gratitude, I want to briefly state I may have these titles associated with the gratitude in my bio. I may have uh, even had some writing accolades attached to them as well. That doesn't make me an expert. That doesn't mean that I implement gratitude to the even to the best of my ability. And it's a work in progress every day. So just because I'm about to tell you a story of when I found gratitude doesn't mean gratitude fills my heart on a consistent basis. And that's the crux of the human condition, especially when you turn something that you're passionate about into an actual job. That's a whole nother thing. I guess that's the status quo part. But um, I used to be in theater. We would travel around the world producing these plays, uh, Broadway shows, touring shows, singing shows, depressive shows, happy shows, whatever the show was. We were good at producing them or raising money for them. And there was this one show that we would tour around with that was about Fiorello LaGuardia, the former mayor of New York City. He was a seven-term congressman, three-term mayor. His first job was in the consulate in Fiumi, Italy, which was under Hungarian rule during World War I. He was a motherfucker. He was great. He was this little five-foot-two fat dude who ran New York City for decades. And we used that play as a tool to relate a lot of what Fiorello LaGuardia was going through, what the world was going through in the 1930s and 40s with what was happening in our country today. And one of the things that happened after one of the performances is that someone came up to us and gave the actor, who was also the director, a poem about veterans. And the poem was called A Soldier Died Today. And it was written by A. Lawrence Vaincourt. And it was essentially giving gratitude to veterans. It was essentially saying, you know, the politicians may have TV funerals, but what happens to the veteran? And so we ended up falling in love with the poem so much and giving gratitude to veterans so much that we would read the poem. The actor would go on, that play was a one-man show, but the actor would actually read that poem on stage after every performance. And so whether we were doing it at the United States Capitol for the United States Congress, or whether we were doing it for young kids or whatever in between, we would read that poem. And one day someone said, hey, let's turn it into a movie. Let's turn it into a short film of the actor reading that poem. And we recorded it and we released it on Memorial Day of 2015. And it went on to receive over 40 million views, 1.2 million shares, and it won us two Emmy Awards. It's a At the same time that, that we were putting out that, that I was leading marketing on and it was blowing up all over the world, we were also putting on a Broadway play in Italy. And so I was over in Italy and we were just immersed in the Italian culture. It, you know, it was intoxicating. It's Rome. It's thousands of years old. They walk different. They talk different. They love different. Everything is different. Specifically, it's how they ate together. And so I decided I wanted to recreate that magic here in New York City. And I invented a pasta sauce recipe. And I thought, wow, this pasta sauce is pretty good. I should probably feed it to people to see if it really is good. And that's when we started hosting dinner parties. 
And at every single one of those dinners, I would ask the same question. And the question's topic was gratitude. And it was inspired by the work, or the gratitude that we had just done on Just a Common Soldier. And the rest was history. And during those dinners, is there something that you can name specifically that really was feeding you and motivating you to continue hosting and being a part of that? When I was in college, sophomore year in college, I was a big old drunk. Uh, and, And what I mean by that is I hated myself so much that all I wanted to do all day was drink and do much of nothing and mix in a bunch of drugs and other malevolent behaviors. And at one point, you know, my parents came to me and said, we're going to send you off to rehab. This has gone a little too far. I was crashing cars. I was getting kicked out of things. I was doing things that I wasn't born to do. And so I went off to rehab and like the minute that I checked into rehab, the people at my first rehab said that I had to identify myself as an alcoholic. I had to stand up in front of my peers and say, hi, my name's Chris. I'm an alcoholic and blah, blah, blah. Right? That's what rehab's for. And so they kept doing that. I kept getting kicked out of rehabs. They kept doing that kept getting kicked out of rehabs. And when I was 11 and a half months sober, started drinking again and just kept drinking. Ended up becoming a boat captain and doing some things in the great outdoors. And so I wouldn't drink as much because I was in love with the great outdoors, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, when I was at those dinners, I realized a very important thing that someone in a Uh, Johan Hari had once said in his TED Talk, which is that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's human connection. So for so many years, they tried to get me to be sober, to take care of these isms within me, when really the main thing that was happening that I wasn't addressing at all was just I was lonely as shit. and. I was genuinely not feeling seen or heard, and I didn't have a sense of belonging or a clear purpose to have an impact, and that was wreaking havoc on my soul. And so these dinners proved to me that I didn't have to get drunk to fit in. I didn't have to get drunk to cure my isms. I just had to create the safe spaces for people to gather and have them show up and reveal their souls through stories. That was intoxicating. It was amazing. The first chapter of my first book, Gratitude and Pasta, states, you don't have to be alone to be lonely. You can have the best friends in the world, and you can feel completely unseen. I had repressive sexual identities that never came out until I was an adult. I had dreams of what I wanted to be, things I wanted to experience, things I wanted to do. I didn't quite have the people around me that I wanted to have those conversations with. I didn't know any pansexual people. I only knew you know, one or two gay people in, in the deep Republican South. But I think the most important part of that that answer is that I was always surrounded by thousands of loving, loving, loving people, but I still felt the most alone. Loneliness is that great epidemic that we're all facing. You know, the Surgeon General of the United States reports that being lonely is equivalent to the reduction of lifespan of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Seven years off your life. And where are you hosting these dinners in the beginning? In the beginning, starting July 15th, 2015, we would host them in our 
350-square-foot studio apartment <laughs> on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Yes. Arrivals were at 6.30 p.m. sharp. Dinner was served at 8. But at 7.47 p.m., we put the pasta in the pot and delegated 11 specific tasks empowering the attendees to work together to create the meal. By about 8.20, 8.22 we'd open up for a big group discussion where we'd go around answering a very specific question on gratitude. And then we'd end between 9.28 and 9.32. And so they were all for free uh, to begin with. They were all for free in our home. The rule was you just brought a bottle of wine. The attendance rule was the first time you come, you come alone. The second time you come, you're able to bring a friend. And then after that, you're eligible to nominate someone to attend without you having to be there. Ooh, okay. And what was the process like when you were developing these structures around this? You know, it seems like, okay, you know, we're just hosting a dinner. That's not a big deal. But the intentionality behind it is really where the magic happens. The intentionality the safety in the structure. I think we wrote about this in the first book. Our dinners were a culmination of a couple things in my life. Me being Italian and just wanting to just have like a bacchanal, just of food and drink and conversation. Me being Southern and opening up my home and being generous and that kind of thing. Me having a a history in the theater in which, you know, everything in the theater had to hit a certain note, musical note, you know, from stage choreography and running a show and being a tour manager. My history in the rooms of AA, I knew that there was a specific structure that people had to follow. There was a moderator, there was a leader, that kind of thing. And then the fifth thing was my history in BDSM. I've been in the kink community since I was, I mean, a kid, a literal kid. And so I knew the safety and intimacy and connection that could be created through tremendous constraints and rules. And that the greater of a leader, the greater of a hard-edged commander that I was at those dinner parties, actually the safer and more vulnerable I would be able to get our attendees. BDSM is probably the most important one of the five to have experience in. We were firm on our rules and we didn't vary far from them because when you build a product that people get to know, love and trust, and you don't change it much, you, you play with it, but you don't change it much, it becomes referable. It's very easy for people to say, oh my God, I went to one of these things. Uh, let me think about the coolest person in my network to attend to the next one or to invite to the next one that I go to. Hey, Bob, I went to this thing. This is exactly how it was when I went. Chris never changes the format. Do you want to come? It's really safe that way. And, and that's that's how, you know, eventually when they stopped just being free dinners in our home and they started being a corporate product, that's how we now have a 100% word of mouth referral based business because we, we've really honed in on a very core product. We talked about that a lot on this last tour that I was on since the, some of the band members are, were pretty hardcore into the punk rock community. And obviously from the outside, a lot of the stereotypes of punk rock is it's just it's sex and drugs and rock and roll and it's tattoos and piercings and it's hardcore and all of these quote unquote negative stereotypes. And the reality is there are so many systems and procedures and structures in place that make a punk rock show or a hardcore show what it is. And it is safe and it's a, it's a space for people to express themselves in that same way that you're talking about. And those unspoken rules that people don't know about. That's why I think that that fear comes into play because they don't understand it. And that's obviously what we were talking about earlier. And that is the purpose of the podcast to really shine a light on that. And so you're hosting these dinners, like you said, 
in your 350 square foot apartment. <laughs> And then Again, eventually one, one one room, folks. It was one room. <laughs> it was a two burner stove. Oh yeah. We had a Murphy bed. <laughs> the the toilet, if you took a poop, it would it, the, the toilet the, the bathroom was attached to the right living there. room, <laughs> dining room, kitchen. What it was all just one room. Right. And so, you know, people would have to like go down to the restaurant downstairs to take a poop during dinner. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and so you are eventually expanding. And what is that transition like? How do you go from this fun, friendly dinner to now you're doing this on a on a corporate scale? And not only are you doing it on a corporate scale, you're paying bills. It didn't happen overnight. This is really like over the course of 18 months. You know, they started off for free in our home. And for everybody who's listening, I'm just going to break it to you. I wasn't feeding them like... Like, I'm not some trust fund kid that was feeding them, like, I don't know, a Michelin star <laughs> thing. The whole dinner was costing us $40 mm. total. Yeah. You know, one guy, his name was Rob. He came to me and he said, dude, you're so good at hosting these dinner parties. Look, everybody cries. I'm trying to bring together 15 of my investors of my new social club. Could I hire you to do this for me and my investors? I was like, sure. And so he brought 15 random folks over to my home and he slipped me 200 bucks and I made them all cry. And, uh, you know, he got more investment and blah, blah, blah. So that, that was our first client, literally. From there, I started just talking about it. And I started thinking about it through the lens of selling this product, this experience to companies. And what was pretty awesome is that on accident, without us architecting it literally at all, as you mentioned in the bio, we had been serving Fortune 50 CEOs. Academy Award winners, Super Bowl champion, founders of billion-dollar companies. They were just, they were the ones who were begging to come to our dinner parties. A year into our dinner parties, if you looked around the dinner table, they were super successful people. When someone who would attend our dinners would have a life-changing experience, and I'd say to them, hey, Lindsay, you're welcome to come back a second time if you'd like. Oh, and by the way, if you'd like to bring someone as your guest, be my guest. And you would take that and you'd say, holy fuck, I get to come back again? Who? Oh my God. Who should I bring? Oh my God. Oh my God. And so our social network climbed rapidly because people would just bring the best people in their network. And so once I started just communicating around the dinner table of saying, hey, funny thing is, I just did one of these things for a company last week. If any of you want to do this for your company, let's chat about it. And then word just spread. And then, yeah, game on. Is there any specific way that you were building these relationships and harnessing that power? So many people these days, they put on a mask. So many people these days feel the pressure of needing to fit inside a box, to operate inside the status quo. But if your heart is telling you to do something different or be who you are, just you being that person in itself is the superpower that others need. You don't have to be good at calculating numbers. You don't have to be good at go-to-market strategy. You don't have to be the best marketer in the world. I'm certainly not the best at anything that I do except being myself. And that's the only fucking thing people want in anyone that they're in a relationship with. That's it. That's the only thing that I do good. Okay. I'm really fucking good at hosting virtual gratitude experiences. But 
<laughs> that's a skill you can hone, but. <laughs> but it's only because I bring my full self to every experience. What are the things that you do daily, weekly, monthly basis, whether they're habits, rituals, experiences, ways of thinking, anything like that, that allows you to continue to cultivate who you are versus what you quote unquote should be? I don't think I have an answer of any type of consistent practice. Well, I meditate every day. I mean, I don't know if the listeners are watching this on video, but I, I meditate here every day, twice a day. This is my own little sanctuary. And we got our home here in Brooklyn. This is just my little office. I got a little corner <laughs> that I'm allowed to sit at. And and this is uh, this is where I meditate every day, twice a day. And is that TM or any specific type of meditation? Yeah, transcendental meditation. That allows me to slow down my thoughts enough to be able to process what's there. What thoughts are authentic? What thoughts are creating a jarring thing in my system or my stomach? Transcendental meditation, first and foremost, number one thing I do. I think the second thing I do is just do shit. I am not one to... Like sit, for better or for worse, I'm not one to sit and think about things that I'm about to do. I just do them. And if I don't like it, then I don't like it. I'll stop doing it. That's it. You know, I'm going, I'm talking about the full spectrum of things, whether it's sexuality, travel, business, strategy, whatever it is, I'll do it. I'll spend money hiring someone to do something for my business. And it will feel inauthentic. And so I'll say, all right, I just spent money learning that I don't like that being part of my business. Don't do it again. An example of that would be my book. Our last book, Gratitude Through Hard Times, hit number one on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And yeah, that's great and everything. But that was me spending $120,000 for a vanity metric. That's all that was. That's all that fucking was. Now, I'm ignoring the fact that putting Wall Street Journal bestseller on a book has more people read it. And the more people that read it, the more people that write in saying, this is how it saved my life. This is how it saved my marriage. This is how blah, blah, blah. So there's pros and cons. But Paying for vanity metrics is something that I've spent money on and it feels like shit. And so that's not me being authentic. That's me worrying more about what people think of me than making myself worth knowing. From a like a sexual identity or sexual part, I'll go out and try things. And, and if it's not me, it's not me. So that's a big thing is just going and doing things. And it's this isn't the Nike thing of just do it. This is like the only way I'll get to, I get to know myself more by learning what I don't like than hypothetically saying what I do like. I'm very curious since I saw that you did the Knowles training down in Chile. I also, I did my time abroad during undergrad in Chile. And you had mentioned earlier the importance of being in the outdoors and connecting to nature and how that was part of what allowed you to recenter. Could you shed a little bit of light on, on any of those experiences? The great thing about going out into nature, especially doing a Knowles course down in Patagonia, is that death was around every corner. In my early 20s, I spent three months living on a glacier in Chilean Patagonia, down at the tip of the world. And when you go this far down south, it's like you're going that far up north. You're near the Southern Pole. You're near Antarctica. And Chilean Patagonia is at a latitude 
down at the bottom of the earth where the wind whips around the world and hits no other landmass until it whacks into Chilean Patagonia. Whack. Whack. And so it's alive, it's dangerous, it's vibrant, it's raw. When you're exposed to nature like that, bone chilling, glacial, arctic water, high, high, high winds, it forces you to come into the present. And it forces you to exist for the moment. And the true beauty of life happens right in front of you in the moment. The poet Mary Oliver once said that the beginning of devotion is attention or whatever it is, but it's like you need to become in the present in order to live. And that's the the true start of devotion, of passion, of living, of being, of changing, of doing. And, you know, nature did that for me. It gave me the place to experience solitude. It also gave me the chance to work alongside other human beings just to stay alive. Um, Sebastian Junger writes a great book named Tribe. And in it, he finds that when people go through common suffering together, it actually forms what's called trauma bonds. And those trauma bonds form the most meaningful moments of human connection possible. You survive something great together. And being in the great outdoors, especially down on a glacier in Chilean Patagonia, gave me the opportunity to survive. You know, the trivial shit that we bother ourselves with on a daily basis melts away when all you're worried about is whether or not you're going to die during this next ice crossing. No doubt. Yeah, you definitely had a different experience than I did when I went to Patagonia. (laughs) Oh, yeah? (laughs) We had, I mean, everything that you're saying resonates in terms of the solitude and, and just that feeling of being small and that bonding that you're talking about. I've always been into photography and I had my camera and I was just complete one track mind and just saw and was like, I must, must get that photo and just kept walking, kept walking, kept walking, captured the image. And the next thing I knew, we had a a tour guide that his name was Ramon and he learned all of his very limited English in California. So everything was, yeah, man, dude, dude. (laughs) <laughs> and all I heard was, dude, dude. <laughs> I turned around and he was just waving frantically. And I couldn't hear him because I was so far away. And as I thankfully got closer and closer, it was told to me that I was in quicksand. Those oh shit moments, those near death moments. That's that's where the magic happens. And I think that is that is truly what what nature can do. There's actually a book called The Universe Doesn't Give a Flying Fuck About You. And the whole premise of the book is called Cosmic Insignificance Therapy. Okay. See, I, you know, I, I believe personally that, um, you know, everybody's convincing themselves that they need to, that they need to be somebody <laughs> these days. They need to be someone's hero. They need to be an influencer. They need to be worth knowing. They need to have an impact. They need to create a legacy. They need to be remembered. That's a lot of pressure for a human being. I mean, the truth is there's like 8 billion of us. Like, odds are we will not be remembered. And we will not do anything of great acclaim. We will not do anything worth talking about a generation from now. And we're not going to save the world. We're not going to be someone's hero. We're not going to do like all this shit that we're setting out to do on our to-do list. And the minute that we realize that life is not about accomplishing all those things, and the minute we realize that like we're small and insignificant as shit, and that's all right, a huge weight lifts off your shoulder. That's what we're here for. (laughs) That's what we're here for. And so being in nature does part of that so 
I'll read a quick passage. Time Management for Mortals It's just after half past seven on a rainy morning in midsummer when I park my car beside the road, zip up my waterproof jacket, and set off by foot into the high moors of the northern Yorkshire Dales. There's a splendor to this terrain that's most powerful when you're alone and in no danger of being distracted from the barren drama of it all by pleasant conversation. Think about that fucking sentence, huh? You get to use nature to escape from the barren drama of pleasant conversation. Because that's what the world's become. Meaningless, barren conversation filled with nothingness. And nature gives you an escape from that. And furthermore, when you take a walk in nature, Kiran Sataya calls taking a walk in nature an atelic activity, meaning that its value isn't derived from a telos or an ultimate aim, like a telescope, right? Telescope, telos. You shouldn't be aiming to get a walk done, nor are you likely to reach a point in life when you've accomplished all the walking you were aiming to do. You can stop doing these things, and eventually you will, but you cannot complete them. They have no outcome whose achievement exhausts them and therefore brings them to an end. And so the only reason to do them is for themselves alone. There's no more to going for a walk than what you're doing right now. And I think that's the beauty of nature is that you can just go and be in nature. You don't need anything in nature. You don't need to accomplish anything in nature except stay alive. Before we wrap up, we do ask every guest two questions. What is the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten? And to end it on a Presumably good note. What is the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Worst piece of advice, take off the fanny pack. I was wearing the fanny pack before the fanny pack became cool again. And there's like newspapers that used to write articles about me wearing my fanny pack before the fanny pack was a fanny pack. I was the first person in history to give a TED Talk wearing a fanny pack. I've done a lot with this fanny pack. Even in my paper-filled achievement shit, people to this day, and I won't name names, still come to me and say, imagine how successful you'd be if you just took the fanny pack off. What? You want to make a man non-suicidal self-injure himself? Tell him to take his fucking fanny pack off when he was at the top of his career. What are you talking about? Best piece of advice, I went snow sledding in Central Park with my buddy Dave. And if you looked at my life then, I had just left theater. I just removed myself from my theater company. I was only about 25 dinners deep inside my own home. They were all free inside my home. I'd won awards in this thing and done stuff in that thing and done thing. I had a bunch of different things that were on my plate. After snow sledding, we were drinking a Heineken and Dave said, so what are you going to do next? What are you going to do with your life? I said, oh, you know, maybe I'll start a video production company uh, or maybe I'll start another theater company or maybe I'll start a marketing company or maybe I'll do these dinner parties or maybe, or maybe. And he said, what would be the one that would be the hardest to do right now? So the dinner parties. He said, what would re- require the most strategic thinking? The dinner parties. What would fulfill your heart the most? The dinner parties. He said, good, do the dinner parties. <laughs> I said, what? He said, man, you got a lot of great ideas. But I'll reference the old Russian proverb. You can't chase two rabbits at the same time. They'll both get away. Focus equals growth. And I, pe- I picked the dinners. I haven't looked back ever since. 
And it's the best piece of advice I've ever gotten. Focus equals growth. I know all the people that that are listening out there, you're thinking to yourself, how am I going to go make my mark and challenge the status quo? How am I going to tell all those people who didn't believe in me when I was a kid that they were wrong and that I can do anything I want to do? I know you. I am you. I get it. But let me give one sage piece of advice. Just try one fucking thing. You got to give it a couple of years. You're going to bang your head up against the wall. You might not be able to quit your job to pursue a life of passion. It might not make sense all at once, but you got to pick that one thing and exhaust yourself on that thing. Exhaust yourself so much that it makes people wonder, what the heck is he up to over there? And only then can he break through and break free of the status quo in an efficient and sustainable manner. Because you could look crazy as shit trying 15 different things to get away from the status quo, but you really, really learn the most about yourself when you pick one thing and you fail at it. And your back's up against the wall and people are saying, holy shit, what's coming next with this? And you just got to go figure it out. That's It's going to be hard to break free this status quo. It was really hard for us. I almost lost my life a ton of times in the process. Could have turned back a ton of times in the process, but focus equals growth. We pick one thing and kept on doing it. On that note, thank you. I do not I do not envy you as a listener of this podcast. You must be in a very confused period of your life right now, but I can tell you with Lindsay, you've come to the right source. She's there with empathy. She's been through the exact same shit that you're going through right now. And keep on keeping on. Keep Hit that subscribe button and, and keep on listening to these amazing things. Reach out to Lindsay. She's an empathetic listener. She's a great question asker, as she's proven in this podcast today. I don't know if I'm doing your closing statement or not for you. You but, did, uh, and I'll take it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Appreciate it all. Thank you for listening to The Cost of the Status Quo and learning the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find us at costofthestatusquo.com or on Instagram at costofthestatusquo. If you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com or on Instagram at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening. Hope you have an awesome day.